So Laura joined Home Instead Senior Care Home Office in Omaha, Nebraska in June in 2009. She spent five years as a trainer, training facility, training, sorry, I can't speak today, trainer, training, franchise offices on business operating software and other operational functions. It wasn't long after that that she began began there building relationships with other franchise owners that she knew that she also wanted to become a franchise owner of her own home instead. Senior care. Uh, Laura has seen firsthand the impact senior instead, that's a mouthful, <laughs> senior, or sorry, uh, home instead senior care has had on clients, caregivers, families, and communities across the globe. She is passionate about helping seniors and their families in the Rapid City and the Black Hills. She is an avid Nebraska Husker volleyball and football fan, and in her spare time, she loves to cook, sing, and is a weather enthusiast. And with that, I give you Laura Dyer. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I'm excited to be here. Uh, Leah Braun told me about this, I was kind of joking around earlier, a few months ago, and I thought, oh, it's August, I've got plenty of time to plan. <laughs> and here we are, first week of August is done. So, yes, I am Laura Dyer, and I own Home Instead Senior Care here in Rapid City. I worked for the home office, we have over 1,100 franchises internationally. Um, it began in 1994 in Omaha, so I worked at the home office and I got five years under my belt. I was talking to Dr. Enns, he had mentioned how sometimes business owners, you need to start kind of at that bottom and get some ropes, and I did by working at the corporate office. But even then, there are days four years into this where I'm like, what am I doing? Even with, with uh, those ropes that I learned. So, my husband and I moved up here in April of 2014 to open Home Instead in May of 2014. And at that time, it was just me. He still had his full-time job back in Omaha. And I remember the day we opened, I unlocked the front door. I walked into an office, no employees. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I doing? In fact, I even worked on a card table because our furniture hadn't come in yet. And so just that day, I was doing these little things, posting you know, our jobs for our caregivers out on Craigslist hoping the phone would ring, and it did, I mean, that day. And in fact, that day, we got our first phone call at, from the employment ad that I put on Craigslist for a caregiver, and she is still an employee today. So just fast forward, just everything that happened from that day, today, four years later, it's just amazing. And a lot of the people that have been there from the beginning are still with us today, improving seniors' lives and making a huge difference. Our office staff grew to where we had to move out of 429 Quincy, and we are now at 17 <coughs> Street across from the fire department and Cornerstone Mission. So we have a much bigger office, which we need, and we're probably gonna outgrow that before our lease is up. But it's seeing those kinds of uh, goals and, and milestones where it just really makes all the difference in the world. Our territory spans the entire western quarter of South Dakota, meaning if somebody needs our care, our franchise standards allows, allows us to provide care from Pennington County all the way over to Wyoming, from the Nebraska border all the way to North Dakota. So our franchise territory is vast. And I knew we had potential in both the northern and southern hills, but I had to get this up and going in Rapid City, and we have. So for the better part of the last year, in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, we need to be in Spearfish, we need to be in Spearfish. But it's not that easy. And so just on August 1st, we actually, the lease is uh, valid for our office location in Spearfish. So this is brand new, and I haven't even really been able to make it up there too often as much as I'd like to, but we've got a presence now in the Northern Hills, which I've been really, really excited about for the last, year or so. So we're continuing to grow in Rapid exponentially every month and now it's almost like I'm opening another brand new business. I'm doing it all over again. But I'm really excited about it. Our vision statement is to be the Black Hills most reliable, compassionate, family-oriented, in-home, non-medical care company while providing independence, peace of mind, and tranquility for those aging in place. Our mission statement is to provide personalized one-on-one -on -one care to ensure safety, independence, and well-being wherever home may be. And that is key because we do have a lot of clients who are in facilities. So we fill in gaps. Um, I've seen it firsthand. I think families 
and, and even doctors' knee-jerk reaction is, if somebody is getting up there in age and they're getting more and more health problems, they're more and more of a fall risk, we have to put them in a facility. Here's what I say. There's a time and a place for a facility, no doubt about that. But some of the problems that we face as we age, moving from a home address to a facility isn't gonna solve that problem. The problem is still gonna be there. 98% of people want to age at home. That's where they're comfortable. So if we can provide that care in a home, keep people out of facilities that can maintain their safety and independence at home, keep those beds open for people that really need those facilities. I talk to a lot of people around here in facilities. There are waiting lists like you wouldn't believe, and they have to pick and choose who takes those beds. So there's a lot of times people are waiting a very long time to get into an assisted or independent facility. But in that interim time, they still need some sort of care to maintain their safety and independence. Our caregivers are our front line and the most important people that we have. And that is one of my challenges, finding that good help, finding people who want to do this as a career. I can train people on what they can and can't do for our clients. I cannot train passion, compassion, and the want, drive, and the, the need to do this job. And to find a good balance of that is very, very difficult. A lot of our caregivers have been with us for a long time. They have found a passion. We have a wide range of ages. This is a good supplemental part-time job for students, and we have people who have decided they want to come out of retirement and make a difference in someone's lives part-time during the week. Again, finding that good help is, is one of our, our biggest challenges, the retention and, and the, the recruitment of people that want to do this job. Don't, they don't even know this kind of business even exists. They think they have to be a CNA. They think they have to, in order to help provide quality care to somebody, they have to go into a nursing home to do that. And when they find out this is one-on-one -on -one care, I can do this in a home, and I don't have to have a CNA or any kind of higher level uh, certification, they get really excited about that. And a lot of people have found their calling in this type of position. The services we provide are strictly non-medical. So we provide, and I give a laundry list, but there's, all, there's always things reading between the lines, but we provide non-medical services such as transportation to and from doctor's visits. We can also be the eyes and ears at a doctor's appointment so that the right medication information is getting back to the people that need to know. Physical therapy reminders so that they're doing exercises at home. Follow-up visits so they're actually getting to the doctor. Oftentimes our clients don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to get out of bed to go to the doctor. Rescheduling doctor's visits can take six to eight weeks, so our caregivers there prompting them to get, do what you need to do to stay healthy and independent is, is making a difference for them too. We can do laundry, change bed linens, meal preparation. Our seniors do not eat correctly, if at all. And so being there to make sure that they're eating and, and getting proper nutrition is important. Medication reminders, we're seeing medications are very, very difficult to manage, especially if we're dealing with somebody who maybe has memory issues. They don't know when they've taken them, if they've taken them. So medication management is a safety issue. Uh, provide personal care service, such as assistance, dressing, bathing, grooming, toileting, incontinence care. And then we provide specialized services that include hospice and Alzheimer's. All of our caregivers are trained in Alzheimer's and dementia. We are seeing an enormous increase in clients where their families need assistance with this. And the training has proven very beneficial because even if our caregivers are working with somebody who hasn't had a diagnosis, and I air quote that because that's a, can't really diagnose it right away, they're noticing the signs. And so they're able to give a doctor very specific information on what's going on. Because when families aren't there seeing it so much, it's hard to relay proper information to a doctor about signs and symptoms of not just Alzheimer's and dementia, but any chronic illness that people face when they age. So we're those eyes and ears to get proper information back to doctors. So all of our services are non-medical. Um, yes? It, in a nutshell.
I could talk about this for all day long, so I am open to questions and anything else. Um, like, what are the hours that a typical, you know, you said part you have a lot of part-time employees, students. Um, what are the hours that maybe would fit in with a nursing student schedule or something? Excellent question. We have several clients that are 24 seven. So we need different varieties of availability. We have students who like to work the overnights, that's when they study. Um, some of them just, you know, maybe work weekends or something like that. So uh, we, we make sure that they get with the right client, but we can offer any kind of part-time hour specific to evenings or days or weekends or overnights. We customize to what the caregivers can work, because we can fit. And we right now, we actually have a client who requires 24 hour care with two characters. That amount of manpower just for one client is significant, but it provides a lot of opportunity for people that want to work. We just schedule them when they can work. So it, it is pretty flexible. The one thing with our availability and our caregivers is, you tell us when you want to work, but we expect you to stick to that because we hire based on that. And, and we sign up clients based on when our caregivers are able to work too. We try to be as flexible as possible, but we want it to work for everybody. So we're, we're pretty stringent on just stay with the availability that you agree to because that's we're pretty strict on that just because we base our hiring on all of that. But it's very flexible. So it's perfect for part-time and especially nursing students or anybody Russ Sands, uh, retired here at Piedmont. Um, so from the standpoint of coverage for, for your clients, is, does any of this fall in being in the cracks and no care? Or, because I, I know <laughs> I, have a, I have a very extensive long-term care policy okay. by Hancock, and it was one of the last ones, it's, and no one's doing it anymore. I know. So uh, what's the path forward, what do you see? Coverage. Currently, Medicare does not cover this. Uh, being a franchise, we have a corporate office, and they have a government affairs department that lobbies for this all the time. So hopefully, Medicaid waivers, we, we do allow Medicaid waiver. VA benefits do cover a portion of this. Long-term care insurance, which we're seeing uh, increase quite a bit. Um, and then mostly it's private pay. But even then, all of those are gonna have their own little intricacies of the coverage. So it's never just a, I can't ever tell one family, well, John Hancock does this for this client, so this is what we're, it, it's different. So we always have to process it just to see what that coverage would be. But yeah, Medicare doesn't cover it right now. Michelle. I'm Michelle King, SDCEO. So do you do, as a business, do you do any type of collaborative work with like regional or any of, of the other like um, private healthcare? That's my main networking. I gotta so find the right you people. Kind of referrals yes, from? I gotta yeah. find the right people to get to talk to. In each of In. those, yeah. And really what we see, it, and it's we see it a lot, there are a lot of places that can't give a name out. So they'll give a list. So I try to make sure that we're always on that list. But we get calls and I try to build relationships with the social workers that call us individually, hoping that you know they're the ones that are always gonna call us just based on the good experience that they had. Uh, but yes, we, regional's a big one that we try to get into, you know, but they have their own kind of home health thing too, so we're in a direct competition with them. But finding the right people to build those relationships Look, at the end of the day, I know they can't give a name out. I'm just, just appreciative that people that need this type of service have different places to call. 20 years ago, you didn't. 20 years ago, this wasn't even really heard of. So the more options that people have, we have to stand out with our customer service and the quality of care that we provide, and we're proving that, no doubt about that. Uh, but I'm glad they have options because one size does not fit all in this industry. I think too, people, you know, consumers, have, you know, appreciate options. Right. And so it's like, if you only have one option, that's not an option. Exactly. Exactly. 
So do you, do you try to also network with uh, senior community centers? We do. Or like churches and mm -hmm. you know, synagogues or whatever. Uh, to me, there is nobody that couldn't use our information. I have five demographics that I have to hit. I have to find the people who need the care and don't know we exist. And in the back of their mind, they're scared to death because they keep thinking, I have to go to a nursing home. That's my only option. I have gotta find those people. Two, I've gotta find their kids who are taking care of them, missing out on work, taking them to appointments, worrying about them all the time. I just dealt with a family yesterday where the daughter's gotta go back to Baltimore on Friday. She's like, I can't leave without knowing that they're taken care of. I gotta find the kids that are dealing with this near or far. Three, I gotta network to regional social workers, doctors, nurses, rehab people, priests, church nurses, you name it. Just the ones that come into contact with the people that eventually will need the care. Four, I have to find my employees. So I gotta find the people who, are, who want to do this kind of job. And five, I have to connect with people that this doesn't even relate to. Because one day they're gonna go into work and their desk mate is gonna be gone again and that person is like, I'm picking up the slack again because they're gone for mom. Here, here's Laura's card. You gotta call home instead. Everyone can benefit from this information. And we see this a lot when I have a booth somewhere. So our Aging Gracefully Expo is coming up in September. It's a big deal here and we love putting, we don't put it on. Senior Information Network puts it on, but anybody involved in aging or senior related issues in rapid attend this this um, expo and people will walk by the booth oh I don't need you now and they'll just walk away and I'm like I know but you will <laughs> so let's find out now because what happens is we get the phone call it's a crisis just like this family yesterday we don't know what we're doing I leave Friday for Baltimore what do we do if six months ago to a year they even knew their options, it wouldn't be such a panic event of, I gotta figure this out now. When people make those decisions in crisis mode, they make it based on finances and emotion. And they're not always the right decision. It's like, get this out of the way so I can fly home and at least try to have some peace of mind. So connecting and getting to people that, not, that wouldn't necessarily need it right now, but know it's out there for their neighbor, friends, coworkers, because people do not know their options. We hear it all the time. So what is the range of cost from like, um, say somebody who just needs assistance with getting to medical appointments or scheduling to somebody that needs two caregivers around the clock? What's the range? We have two prices and we assess that. We, well, we'll quote that at the assessment. It's in the mid twenties per hour. Yet we have our companionship home helper, like a cutoff or something, our companionship home helper, <coughs> and then a specialized. And the specialized has to be pretty specialized. If we've got two people, there are mobility issues, um, use of special equipment like a Hoyer lift, or if it's later stage Alzheimer's where we're managing behaviors. But it, it's mid range, and all pretty much all the competition, we, we charge the same, which then it's another way of. How do we, how do we stand out? How do we differentiate ourselves? So how do you do that? I think our training for our caregivers sets us apart. We have a lot of required training even before they <coughs> go on their first shift. And then we offer training throughout the quarter, which it's not required. I want them to find value in it, uh, but they get wage increases for that additional quarterly training that they take. I train on and this is all pushed down from corporate. So I, I don't pretend to be a nurse or a doctor because I'm not. But it's a benefit being a franchise because they come up with all of this training. They disseminate it to the owners. So then, and I was a trainer. Well, I've always been a corporate trainer since I graduated college. So I can kind of get back into that capacity of what I used to do before owning this. Um, but I also think we do provide quality of care. We, we do get a lot of good feedback from families. Uh, I offer references on any inquiry that comes in. I want a family to feel comfortable because this is a huge decision. And I'm telling you, when they call, they're calling everyone else too. 
and they're going with the person that they felt most comfortable with on the phone. Sometimes it doesn't even come down to price. Who connected with them on the phone? So I take those inquiries. I have a client care coordinator, Sarah, who takes those. And right from that first impression, just a comfort level that a daughter can feel talking to somebody about what she's dealing with, caring for her aging mom, can set us apart. If it's a quick phone call, all business, hurried, rush, distractions, they don't feel that connection of, okay, I need to sit with this person further so that I can find out how they can help me. Because this is highly emotional, highly. And a lot of times you let them tell you what's going on, you just offer them five minutes to tell you what's going on and they're in tears. Everyone else in their family has heard this before. Every coworker, every friend they have, they've all heard this. And now they're telling somebody that doesn't know what's going on, the situation that they're still dealing with day after day, week after week, and the floodgates open. So that connection is absolutely critical. Um, I have like a thousand ideas. Now I've just lost them. But it, I, I really do feel the, the personal connection we make and our caregivers. And I'll tell you too, most of the, the potential clients that we deal with, I don't want anybody in my home. I don't need anybody coming in and taking care of me. I can do it, or my daughter can do it, or I can call a neighbor. They kind of fight for a little bit. And I just want to tell them, just, just give it a week. I promise, just give it a week. And they get that connection with their caregiver. It's amazing. Can she come back another day? I've actually, they just, they want that person. They don't want anybody else. And it's amazing to watch the relationships build and grow because they're so adamant that they don't want it or need it, but then they love. So our, the quality of care we provide is, is a differentiator too. I have another question. Mm -hmm. So as a business owner, opening your second <laughs> business, how do you manage your self-care? Hmm. <laughs> Therapist, right? I, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. Um, it's so important, though. I know. It's because you got to keep going. I don't. I'll just be flat out honest with you. The, with this job, and I know you, most most business owners can relate. It doesn't shut off. We answer our phones twenty four hours a day. So, for instance, last night, eight thirty, I get a text from my on call that somebody calls about services. I have to call that person back. I, it's, I can't shut it off. Now, can I trust somebody else to do that for me? Sure. But it's, I'm still owner. I'm, I'm not backing out of this anytime soon. So, you know, even, even a vacation is impossible because it's in the back of my mind. I'm checking my email. I'm checking my text because this is a, I mean, we're dealing with human lives. We're dealing with death. We're dealing with all kinds of things that it's just like, I need to do better. I can help him. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. I, I, I'm first to admit it. I, I, yeah, so, Dr. Enns. You, you hit on a really good point, and, and it's hard for some of us that are so passionate about the work that we do, uh, letting a bit of that go to entrust it to subordinates, uh, to do the same job, take it on the same passion. And so the advice I've always had for people who've been working in the groups that I've worked with, hire people are better than you. Yes. And it doesn't matter what it is, it's just you got to try to find a person that, uh, that really, really has as much passion for doing what you're doing as yourself. And don't be afraid of hiring somebody that's better than you. I appreciate that. The problem is it's difficult. Mike, <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound like the city. How are you managing your, your second location? Well, what I planned on doing, and of course I opened this the week of rally. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't thinking. Really. So here, here was a challenge with this, and then I'll, I'll get to your question. Because it's, again, a startup, I didn't need a big square footage office space. And so I was looking around to literally rent a small area for a physical address. I did not need a big building at this point in time. So I can't remember. I was in Spearfish for something, and then somebody gave me a name of a landlord. And he and I started talking, and he's like, look, 
I have the I have the perfect space for you. It is literally a desk. <laughs> it's a physical address, but I can keep stuff there. You know, I'll show up on Google Maps, etc. My plan is to be up there two days a week. Everything is still going through the Rapid City business, but I plan on being up there. So once I, I mean, it's just going to be like starting up here. Chicken before they do, I hire a bunch of people and have them work. Basically, it's just at the moment, it's just storefront. Yes. But I, my plan is to be up there networking, getting the word out that we are actually there. And you get, I mean, that's why my question was, do you really, I mean, so Spirit is only 45 miles. It's, it's a quick trip, it's up here, right? Um, <laughs> do you really need a second office that close to your main office? I do. Mm -hmm. Because when people search for in-home care, mm -hmm. we don't show up in Spearfish. Right. Okay. And the need is up there. Hold on. I mean, people All even exactly. Been. So I want, and people hear about us again. That list I said, mm -hmm. people, they get our name on that list, but if they Google and they see it's in Rapid, that's where they stop. Mm -hmm. So, and that's been the thing. You know, we've always had our big territory, but people don't always connect that. Yes, we provide services there. People don't connect that they can apply to work in Spearfish. So again, I, I got to get a client base. I got to get an employee base first. I don't know which one. We can hire people in Spearfish and have them work in Rapid. It's always a possibility too. But yeah, it's that's been on my mind for a couple of years. And, and, and as we've gone on and gotten calls, um, and people are like, oh, I didn't know you were in Spearfish. That started bugging me mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah, I, so, yeah for, for being a uh, Feeling the general public. Yes. Yeah. So, anxious to get that up and running and operational like this. But it is. It's it's like a second business. I had to make sure that our office staff here was fully staffed so I didn't have to be here. My husband is in full time now, which helps a lot. Because I wasn't, I couldn't devote half time here and half time there and have my hands in everything. Mm -hmm. And now that we have people, they're smarter than I am. <laughs> doing the things that I used to do, I'm more comfortable taking more time away and building that. So this is a big commitment, but I'm ready. Anybody else? What is one of the biggest challenges since you started this? You've been four years ago, correct? So what's one of your biggest challenges that you have um, experienced and how did you overcome that? So when I started, I was the person hiring, the person training, the person networking, but I was also the company's first caregiver. So I opened on a Monday and on that Wednesday, I signed my first client. I'm like two days in, you gotta be kidding me. But I was that person's caregiver. And so you know, whatever, when we got a schedule for him and I would have to leave the office, lock it, take the phone, but go provide care for him, take him where he needed to go. He completely understood. He was proud of a startup and supported me along the way. And it was August, right about this time actually. And I hired a couple of people. So I told him, I can't, I can't be your care of anymore. And so I'm going to bring Kayla over and I'm going to introduce you and you'll be in good hands, just like you were with me. And it was a Thursday afternoon. He had a Friday appointment at eight o'clock at the heart doctors. And he lived in the Crown Park apartments by a school. And he was always on time. He said, you gotta make sure, to get out of his apartment, he had to turn left. You have gotta make sure you're here early enough to get me there because you gotta turn left. And with all that school traffic, you're not gonna, it's gonna take a lot longer. I'm like, God, this is fine. Cause I'm never late ever. So I'm bringing Kayla and it's a controlled entrance apartment complex and it's 730 and I'm ringing his apartment and I'm, he's not answering and you can't get in. And I'm like, okay. Cause he had a scooter and he would sit right at the, his door on his scooter, ready to go. There was no wasting time with him. I kept buzzing him and buzzing him and buzzing him and buzzing him. He was not answering. So in my heart's pounding even now. So I'm trying to keep it cool with her. She doesn't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. So 
I'm looking for an 800 number for the management office, and I'm like, they're not going to be open until 8 anyway. Then I'm also thinking, does anybody go to work? Like, why is nobody leaving? <laughs> Everything is out of my control. Finally, somebody comes out, doors open. We go up to his apartment, and I open the door. And mind you, this was summer, 7.40 by this time in the morning. And all of his lights are on. I'm like, what? This is so weird. And I kind of creep in, and I call his name. And there he was, dead on the floor. Poor Kayla, <laughs> her first client. So the challenges of, I mean, it was devastating. Three months. I know owners who that's never happened to. So we have to deal with, you know, becoming very, very attached to these people, almost as family members, and then knowing that we're going to lose them. And unfortunately, those kinds of situations, which aren't common. But since then, we've had a lot of clients die. We've had a lot of clients die with the caregivers there. And the challenge of preparing an employee for that, which is impossible, again, to those that it's happened to, they really do feel like I was there for them. They were at home. Were it not for our services, who knows where they would have been, but they were happy. They went in peace. And so the challenge of the emotions is very, it's very high. So I'm not sure it's a life psychological term, but do you, do you go through training of transference? Uh, I mean, basically, I think in medical schools, most medical schools, right out the shoot, the first week in class could have a time. I mean, that's, that's, that's how people work. <laughs> You know, you got to learn to emotionally uh, uh, set aside, you know, the, you know, do your job, set aside. Yeah, it seems like that's probably, probably difficult. It is. Um, we can definitely improve on that. I, I mean, we never know when it's going to happen, and, and a lot of times it doesn't. I mean, a lot of times our clients, they do get sent to a nursing home, and that, you know, so... We still have that bond with them, but it, we're not, they're not in our care anymore. Um, we try to talk about that as much as possible in training, but I don't want to scare people away either. Yeah. It's, a, it's such a tough balance of, this is what you're going to deal with, people, and you know, I don't want them to cower away like, oh my God, I'm not prepared. That's why finding the right people is so important, I, you know, because they... Some are going to handle that a lot differently than others. We're very supportive with them. If something does happen, you know, they can take as much time off as they want, those kinds of things. Um, but it's, it's a tough balance. Because in the back of their head, they know it might happen. But you can never fully prepare yourself, I'm, me included. But at least I can say, caregiver, I know what you're going through. I don't expect my caregivers to do anything I wouldn't do myself. Mm -hmm. And so if I've experienced that heartache and I have done some of the services that are not pleasant, and at least I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be right there on the front lines with them. Even now, I can be a caregiver if, if we're short-staffed or something like that. How long, is, how, what is your longest term client look like? I mean, how long do you usually have them in your care? Well, looking at what we have now, we have one that we have had since June of 2014. On the flip side, we have clients who we take care of temporarily. We're seeing an increase in this too. Let's just say um, we've had some for several years, we've had some for one, we've had some for four, but let's say somebody is due to be discharged from rehab and they need temporary monitoring so that we can avoid a hospital readmission. Sometimes it's 48 hours. Sometimes it's 24 if they're going to go get cataract surgery or something like that. So we can provide those temporary services as well. But it ranges. We literally have a client who three and a half years ago went home from a facility here on hospice to die. We still have him. And I will vouch every day of the week that him going home to recover is why he's still alive. That's me. Because he is. I mean, literally, he was he was on hospice, and we he's still alive three years later. So there's a testament in home care.
talk to your families now about what will happen when they reach a certain age or if this, then what? My example for that is, Dad, you're a great driver now. Don't have any problems. But I'm going to tell you what. You come home and you have unexplained dents twice, that's when we take away the keys. Or, Mom, you know, you're healthy now, but there's going to come a time where this happens. Let's look at our options of what we can do if that happens. Because that could come sooner than later. A fall, a broken hip, a knee replacement. Those kinds of things are the unpredictable things. They don't know what to do to provide that. As families, sit down and find out what you're going to do if this happens. It's just like any other planet. We're all going to age. This, this isn't going anywhere. The options for aging are decreasing as far as moratoriums on, on the number of beds a nursing home can have. I can go on and on about all this. So there are options, but just educate yourselves and your family. And, and if you hear somebody struggling with Alzheimer's or something aging, let us be a resource. They don't have, you don't have to be a client of ours, but I have the answers. I can give you websites. I can give you books. I can give you all kinds of things to answer questions that people have about aging. We've got the information. It does me no good when it's up here. I want to talk about it, but we, we've got lots of resources.